Six years ago, I met a woman named Teresa whose only child had been murdered. Her son was shot and killed while he worked as a parking lot attendant. Teresa told me that after her son died, she still had all of this maternal love to give, but she had no one to give it to anymore. So she joined Big Brothers and Big Sisters, and she was now mentoring a little girl whose mother was no longer in her life. I wrote about Teresa, and we put her story on the front page. Readers called to say how inspired they were by her. But then there was another call. And the message was from a woman whose voice was dripping with contempt. She said, my son was murdered. You didn't write about him. You didn't ask about my grief. How do you decide what to put in that paper anyway? I guess you didn't care about my son, and you sure didn't care about me. Well, I was shocked, and I was angry. I didn't know this woman, and I didn't know her son, and she was accusing me of purposely ignoring them. Well, she left her number, and you can bet I was going to call her back. I was going to tell her in no uncertain terms that she was wrong. So I called her, and oh my god, did she let me have it. For 10 minutes, she said things that were really hurtful. I was cruel. I was ignorant. I was arrogant. Each thing she said was worse than the next. But as she spoke, something began to shift inside me. Her anger was so pure and so unfiltered that it cut right through my defensiveness. And suddenly, instead of her anger, all I could hear was her pain. Underneath all of that anger, all I could hear was, my son is gone. My son is gone. Well, the words blurred, and as she was wrapping up, I didn't know what to say to her now. I said a prayer, God, please give me the words. Just give me the words. I took a breath, and I said, okay, ma'am, you've said a whole lot here, and I'd like to address everything you said, but the first thing I want to say is that I am so sorry about your son. I am just so, so sorry. I could feel the anger go right out of her. It was like whoosh. And there was a pause, and she said, well, thank you. And I said, can you tell me about your son? What was he like? And she said, oh, man, my son. He was awesome. He was decent and sweet and funny. He would do anything for anybody. He was the favorite. Now, I can't tell you everything we spoke about because we were on the phone for 45 minutes. She told me how her son had been at the wrong place at the wrong time. And I told her that there were hundreds of murders in the city every year, and it was impossible to tell all of their stories. And I said I was sorry about that, too, because every mother's murdered child deserves a story. Now, by the time we got off the phone, we had been talking mom to mom, heart to heart. And I asked her to please stay in touch. You know, I could tell she was one of those great neighborhood ladies, the ones who know all the stories. But I never heard from her again. And that is absolutely OK, because she had already given me something so much bigger than a story. She gave me an epiphany. And the epiphany was this. When I let go that day of my anger, and I was just quiet, and I listened to someone, despite all my judgments about them, I was able to grab hold of things that were so much better. Kindness, compassion, connection. And it happened because I listened in a way that I don't usually listen when I think I'm right. Now, that was really humbling to me, because I always thought I was a good listener. I mean, I'm a journalist, right? So I've been talking and interviewing people and telling their stories for 30 years. You've got to be a good listener to do that. But my conversation with her made me curious, like, wow, where else am I not a good listener? What are the things that I don't know that I don't even know I don't know? And can I become more of a deliberate good listener instead of a coincidental one? Well, what I learned about deliberate listening has changed every one of my relationships. And I think it can change the world. Now, when I first started researching how to be a good listener, there was a ton of information out there. And 
a lot of it was very simplistic. You know, when you listen to people, look them in the eye, <laughs> study their body language, don't interrupt, and when they're done, parrot back what they just said to you. Well, this is easy. And, but I don't know why more of us don't do it. So then I looked back over a lot of the stories that I had written, and I was looking for stories where people were known as being fantastic listeners. And they were adored because of it. So, you know, the managers whose workers adore them so much that they'll come in on weekends to make them happy. The school teachers who everyone says are just the best. Uh, the neighborhood ladies who everyone calls mom. And what they had in common, no matter where they came from, what their education was, their background, what they had in common is that they did not need to be right. They were actually more interested in listening to what you thought and asking why you thought that way than they were in telling you what they thought about what you just said. And that's what separates those of us who struggle with deliberate good listening and those who don't. We like being right. That's it. It's that simple. So I have a confession. I love being right. <laughs> now here is why. Like, life isn't always about right and wrong, black and white. It's gray. You know, we love our teenagers, and we like to ship them off to an island. We want to have our own company and be the boss, but we don't want the stress that comes from being in charge. We want to forgive the doctor for making the understandable mistake, but we kind of want to hold it over his head for making it in the first place. The gray areas are the place of wisdom, nuance, and understanding. They're the place where we learn and grow, which leads to my second confession. I hate learning and growing. <laughs> my friends and I, we say that life is a series of AFCOs. Another freaking growth opportunity. <laughs> now, marriage is filled with them, okay? Parenthood, trust me on this, parenthood is really filled with them. But actually, so is anything in life that's worthwhile. I know this, right? But I never get all excited like, yay, another AFCO. <laughs> because living in the gray area is hard. It takes hard work. So when I'm right, like unequivocally right, like the way I thought I was with that woman on the phone, I'm like, finally, no need to grow, no need to compromise, <laughs> no need to be a grown-up. <laughs> Except the best listening happens when we suspend our right to be right. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean our right to believe that our judgments about someone are objectively true even before we've heard them out. Now, being heard is a fundamental human right. Entire democracies are based upon it. We all have the vote so that our voices will be heard. When we pass bills, we have hearings first to make sure all sides have a say. And our justice system guarantees the right to be heard if we're accused of a crime. So being heard is a fundamental human right, but guess what? Making judgments is a fundamental part of being human. Now, there's no shame in that. There's a lot of information. It's coming at us all the time. We have to discern what it is. It's how we adapt and survive in the wild, in the workplace, and in the world in general. So again, no shame in that, but we have to suspend our judgments if we want to be good listeners. Now, you know what is making that harder to do? Social media. Social media is now changing the way that we communicate. And when it's all good, it's, it's great. You know, when it's about hooking up, not hooking up, when it's about finding... <laughs> Didn't mean that. It's all good. Um, <laughs> it's about finding the best friend from high school who we lost touch with. Uh, it's about putting... I'm not going to get past that, am I? <laughs> It's about posting, you know, a picture of the apple pie we just made. So when it's about that, it's all good. But social engagement is actually creating the conditions for social estrangement. Here's why. Because the traditional forms of communicating are conversations where I talk and you listen, and then you talk and I listen. 
But social media is not about talking and listening. It's about exposing and judging. I could say something clever on Twitter, and people will give it a star. It's a favorite. I could do the same thing on Facebook, and they like it. My daughter once put a photo on Instagram that got 100 hearts. Now, she was thrilled. But those people, nobody asked her, what was she thinking when she took it? How did she come upon it? What was the story behind that? They just hearted it, hearted it. So social media invites us to expose ourselves, which we do. And then it invites others to judge us, which they do. But it's no wonder that we don't see on much of social media the things that actually require much more intimate and perhaps painful conversations. My wife has left me and I'm heartbroken. My boss makes fun of me. I can't stop drinking. I never told my father I love him. Well, no one is ever going to like that stuff because they might actually ridicule, misunderstand, or pity us. And what's getting lost is our willingness to be who we are in all of our messed up, imperfect, glorious humanity. Because we fear that judgment is coming. And that judgment might cut us off from connection. Now, connection is key to human survival. The Quakers know this, right? In meeting, they sit until someone is moved to speak. But even the people who don't speak are providing something of critical importance. They're bearing witness. The same thing happens in 12-step rooms. You can confess to the most heinous thing, and the entire room in unison says one non-judgmental thing. They say, thanks for sharing. They've borne witness. Now, great therapists are, are natural-born witnesses, and thank goodness for them because some listening is best left to the professionals. <laughs> but my fear is that listening has gotten into two camps. There's the expose and judge kind, which is free and ubiquitous. And then there is the therapeutic and credentialed kind, which is expensive and rare. It's as if we think that we are not worthy of being heard, like truly heard and known, unless we pay someone who has sworn an oath not to judge us. The good news, thankfully, is that between these two extremes is a vast, open, gorgeous, and creative place where we can reclaim listening for ourselves. Now, two years ago, I was feeling desperate to do just that. I had gone, I was feeling a little burned out at work, and I had gone through a stretch where a lot of people were calling and asking, they were telling me their stories in the hopes that it would go into the newspaper. But I could tell after I heard them out that although their stories were personally meaningful to them, they might not have enough um, interest for enough readers. But I felt bad telling them that. You know, they just poured their guts out to me, and now I had to tell them I couldn't use their story. But a funny thing happened. Instead of getting upset, most of the time they said, oh, that's okay, it just feels so good to be listened to. Thank you for listening to me. And I thought, you know, I need one day, just one day, where I get to sit and listen to strangers and listen to them with no responsibility to judge anything at all that they say. So one day, I hauled two chairs from my house into Clark Park, which is a gorgeous park in West Philadelphia where they were having an arts festival. And I plopped down the chairs, and I put a sign on an easel. And this is what it said. I will listen, I did this, I will listen with compassion, without judgment, and with an open heart. So is there something you need to say? Tell me. I will listen. Well, people sat down all day long. <laughs> they would sit down and say, you know, I'm just going to stay for a few minutes, and they stayed much longer. <laughs> and they talked, and I listened, and then because it felt right, I talked and they listened, and our conversations were awesome. We talked about losing our way in youth, in a job or a bad relationship, and then the thrill of finding ourselves again. We talked about knowing in our gut when it's time to make a change, but being too afraid to do it or being so happy to do it, or how we did it badly. We talked about pride, the kind that saves us and the kind that gets us in trouble. 
we talked about frustration, kindness, faith. That day in Clark Park reminded me that we are all dying to be heard and known. And we can be, and we will be, when we're just deliberate about having conversations and creating moments where we make people, and all of ourselves actually, feel welcomed to be heard and known. So these days, to keep my listening muscle in shape, I change the way I ride the bus to work. It used to be I would get on the bus, look for an empty seat, preferably by the window, and then I would check Twitter all the way to the office. These days, I'm a listening ninja. <laughs> I get on the bus, and those poor people have no idea what they're in for. I will, I will look for an empty seat, and I'll sit down next to somebody, and I'll just start a conversation. And I do it deliberately. So I might comment on something that they're wearing, or maybe the weather, whatever, something to get us started. And if they respond, I'll ask them a few more questions. And then I spend the rest of the ride focusing entirely on them, with compassion, without judgment, and with an open heart. And our conversations are just as amazing as the ones I had in Clark Park. And I got to tell you that nine times out of 10, I get to work, I am so filled with joy, you would never know I had just been riding public transit. <laughs> And that's because deliberate listening doesn't just change the people who are listened to. It changes the listeners. It, it pulls us out of ourselves, and it reminds us that we're all connected. Now, if I ever doubted that, I just have to remember one final story about yet another mother of yet another murdered young man. Her name is Valrita, and her son was shot and killed by a 15-year-old boy. Valrita made the decision to forgive and have compassion for that boy when she heard his story during the trial. And when I interviewed her, she said, I would think of my son a hundred times a day. And when I thought of him, I also thought of the boy who killed him. And when I thought of that boy, I felt hatred. That meant every time I thought of my son, I felt hatred. I could not have that. By making the deliberate decision to listen with compassion and an open heart to the boy who killed her son, Val Rita got to hang on to the only thing she had left of the child she lost, which was all the love she felt for him every time she thought of him, which was a hundred times a day. I'm telling you, deliberate listening, the kind that happens when we let go of being right, when we let go of our judgments so that we can grab onto things that are so much better, can change the world. The world we live in and the one that lives in our hearts. Thank you for listening.